The following podcast is rated MA E for mechanical and aerospace engineering. Friends, lend me your engineers. Hello once again. My name is Paul. I'm here with Cameron. Hi, Paul. Hello, Cameron. Welcome to another exciting edition of Lend Me Your Engineers. Today on the show, we have part two of our interview with the students who went to Germany, the U.S.-German collaboration to advance research and education in materials for extreme environments. If you are interested in signing up for that program, the deadline is October 31st. You can go online to aerostructures.cecs.ucf.edu slash IRES slash apply. Get all your information there and get your application in before October 31st. Uh, this week, we have part two of our interview with the Germany collaboration to advance research and education in materials for extreme environments. So my commute to work was um, not actually that bad because when you're not driving, it's a lot more relaxing. Mm-hmm. So I would get up and my tram station was directly outside of my apartment because I was in a I don't even know how many stories tall, very, very tall building of university housing. And then I would take uh, the tram for 10 or 15 minutes to the central station, get on the train, take the train, I don't know, 20 minutes to the bus stop and then take the bus 20 minutes to work. Uh, And it was not that bad because, you know, you can listen to music, you don't have to drive, there's no traffic. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's very different. It's definitely look forward to a long commute. Yeah, I mean, when Lynn was waking up, I was already in my first train out of three or four. Uh So (laughs) So you guys went in at different times? No, we lived far enough apart that we would have she would have to get up a lot earlier than me for us to take the same bus. They didn't put you all in the same place. Um, The university housing it's sort of like uh, they're doing us a favor by housing us in university housing, so mm-hmm. we can't really tell them, oh, we have these requirements. Mm-hmm. So I actually I thought we would be in the same building or at least the same street. We were all at least 20 minutes apart by public transit oh. from each other. Oh. And um, so it varies a lot. Um, I had the worst room but the best location. Mm-hmm. And Stephanie had a nice room and a, the Worst location. She actually moved for July to a better location. Oh, what was wrong with the location? Yeah, um, I mean, they're willing to work with uh, you. The first one was just insanely far away. Yeah. It was close to DLR if you could drive. Yeah. But if you have to take public transit, it would take her, I don't know, two hours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so she moved. But they were very nice and accommodating about that. Were yeah. the areas safe? I always felt safe. Yeah. Um, well, okay. I always... Stephanie is looking at me. (laughs) I always felt safe near where I lived. Uh There were definitely places when we traveled where we were perhaps not as safe as we could have been. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll let Stephanie talk about this. (laughs) I I felt I felt safe pretty much the whole time. Uh I mean, Cologne is actually a very safe place. I talked to uh, my mentor at DLR, Dr. Ravi, about this because we were discussing me moving to a different location. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did mention that, I mean, it could be any time at night and y- you'll be fine. The only place that I would I would say, like, I didn't feel as comfortable because I'm, like, here in the United States, or at least in Florida, I'm not used to seeing people <laughs> after, like, 10, <laughs> mm-hmm. at least here. Uh, it's around, the, like, the central station, but that's, that's pretty common, like, in any city mm-hmm. that if you're around this the downtown area or the central station is kind of eh. yeah and you know yeah you'll see homeless people sleeping yeah. but you know they're mm-hmm. not gonna bother you yeah yeah where i was in stuttgart i was not in the actual main part of the city and my housing was right by dlr so like i pretty much if i wasn't going anywhere you know i didn't have to take public transit anywhere or anything like that mm-hmm. so i was in a pretty safe little area mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just basically at a university but you guys are pretty much on your own, right? Like you go to work, but other than that, uh, you for take our care of yourself. First, so the university housing is only for full full month periods, and we were there for ten weeks. So our first two weeks, the three of us who were in Cologne lived together in a, um, I guess, long term hotel suite. So we at least had each other when we were learning how groceries work. 
learning that the windows open differently. It's this really funny. We thought we broke our window because uh-huh. we turned the handle a certain way and it started to come out of the top of the frame and we uh-huh. thought we broke it. No, it's supposed to. If you just let it go, it'll stop with like a six inch gap up top and you're supposed to do that for airflow. It took us an embarrassingly long time <laughs> to discover that. Uh, but anyway, so for our first two weeks of figuring out how to get to work, how to like, where are the groceries, where are the ATMs? We had each other and mm-hmm. that made it a lot easier. But then once we moved into our own housing, like, yeah, we would end up getting to the bus station at the same time and take the bus together to work. But um, generally we would take different trains on the way there. We, If we made plans to hang out after work, then we would, otherwise we would just go home to our separate apartments. So it's not like we were being, there was no like mother figure, mm-hmm. like making sure we're okay and we have what we need. Like mm-hmm. we're treated like adults. Lynn is more of a mother figure, though, I'd say. <laughs> I, was, I was team mom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, no, at least for me, um, the people at DLR were very helpful. So uh, my mentor, she had, you know, um, my mentor and then the person I shared an office space with, they both basically told me where to go shopping, you know, where the mall was, where the, where the smaller grocery store was and stuff like that. So they pointed me on the correct, you know, and I think you guys probably had something similar or Maybe just told you guys. I guess you guys were kind of far away from. Yeah, I, f- I think yeah. there are fewer options in Stuttgart, and they well, all know where, where was, you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we asked questions, they were more than happy to help us. But we liked figuring things out on our own, or at least I did. Um, but like when we had trouble figuring out the the bus schedule. Um, Dr. Barsh got out a bus train schedule for us and highlighted what we needed to know. <laughs> Yeah, if you even make a sound that something that you need something, you want something, <laughs> it's like a pile of information or uh-huh. like they, they just don't know what to do with you to like please you or oh. or help you out. So that's, that was really nice. So if you need help, they are there to help. Mm-hmm. They're not going to mm-hmm. be like, you're on your own. Yeah, no, everyone was very supportive, helpful, welcoming, nice. It was great. That's cool. <laughs> um did you have a chance to watch any German television? Is it is it different? Uh, I actually didn't watch any German television. Mm-hmm. Um, I did see some German commercials because we went to the English language movie theater to see. We saw Wonder Woman and we saw Valerian. And um, it was one of the people at DLR it, I'm friends with and she's really into movies. Yeah. But uh, a lot of the... Um, previews before the movie were in German or in English, but made by Germans. And they were, I found them silly and delightful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Janine, the German, found them annoying, but I guess you always find your own culture's commercials annoying. <laughs> I uh, I try to watch Netflix uh-huh. in German, especially the 70s show. You can't. Netflix is geo-blocked. Yes. Uh, no, 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 I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Really? So the 70s shows, I just selected German. Oh. Well, I mean, you can't do that. You yeah. can't. You can't do that here. You can't put the well, like, in German s- subtitles. Uh huh. But I could over there. I guess you get a different Netflix. Yeah, with the, different each area has a different Netflix. Right. So like Germany had a lot of German shows on Netflix and stuff like that. But they also had a lot of U.S. shows. It just depended on what they had paid for. Mm-hmm. So like you could find. I I remember finding some things. Just you know, in my spare time, I'd watch Netflix or something like that. And I, I was like trying to find it later on and I was like just to show like my brother or something like that. And I realized it was in Germany, in the US, you can't get that on Netflix. Yeah. So there's stuff like that. But um everything had German like subtitles at least or so it was definitely just that the location was different and you couldn't get the US Netflix. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if there was something you wanted to watch, you know, in you know, that you knew was on Netflix in the US, you might not get that in Germany. Were the um was it dubbed in German? Or yes. Was it so, okay. That's why it was That's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Germany loves dubbing things, yeah. apparently. That's uh-huh. what uh, one of my uh, PhD friends was telling me, you know, one of the other students. Uh-huh. And he was saying they love to dub things. So everything has a dub, but they usually will also have the English track unless you want to watch, you know, some things wouldn't, uh, some more of the obscure things or some of the cartoons and stuff like that. He was saying those you won't find the English tracks for. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. yeah, oh, that's always interesting to me. Like when they, 
how humor translates and if it's if, <laughs> if it does or yeah, it does so not. don't don't try to watch the 70s shows in no. japan because <laughs> it's, it's very different uh-huh. uh but there was not a lot of time to watch tv because sure. like like we mentioned our, our commutes were pretty long mm-hmm. and by the time i got home was like seven sometimes and i needed to wake up really early so i barely had time to do groceries, cook, and go to bed because mm-hmm. that's something we forgot to mention is that you don't have groceries open on Sundays. So if we did want to go on a trip on the weekend, you you better have groceries for Monday. Everything because, is closed on Sunday. Yes, um, not everything. Mm-hmm. So a lot of bakeries, a lot of the donut shops will still be open on Sundays, mm-hmm. but any um, like grocery stores, the mall, clothing stores, most things shut down on Sundays. Why? Yeah. Well, because that's the time for rest and friends and family. Mm, and I okay. think that's really great. And I think Germans have a really healthy work-life balance that I wish Americans could have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think American culture is uh, like we we glorify overworking ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that's terrible. And I liked not being able to buy groceries on Sunday because it's like, oh, I'm not, I don't know. It doesn't matter that I have to do groceries. I can't. Not my problem. <laughs> but and, I'm going uh, <laughs> to starve because I didn't plan ahead. Yeah. Well, the, there was this really great um, Chinese place at the bottom floor of my building that was open every day, all day. So <laughs> yeah, um, I was not going to starve. Most restaurants were open on Sundays, it seemed like. Uh-huh. Uh, but I know at least the local bakery for me was only open, I think, up to like 10 a.m. or you know something like that on Sundays. Yeah. So it was basically, you could go there right before church, I think was their idea. You know, because a lot of people, I think, seemed to want to go to church around noon mm-hmm. and if they did go to church. But yeah, so it was a religious, you know, at least it started as a religious thing. And now it's just, Germany is, yeah, known. For, so uh, they get like 30 days off a year, not including holidays. So mm-hmm. like you just get 30 days of vacation. What? <laughs> Everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's, um, and apparently that is a small number compared to like, Europe. Wow. Yeah. So, and they take that very seriously. If they're on vacation, uh, they won't answer email. They won't, you uh-huh. know, like they basically just, you can't contact them. That, so if something kind of goes wrong, at least for me, that's how it was. But that kind of work life balance and separation is so appealing to me that I'm considering there's probably a 20% chance that I want to move to Germany forever. It, I mean, it sounds great. There are dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> that 70s show. So we, lots of things to enjoy. Uh, do you feel like you were able to accomplish everything you wanted to on this trip? Or there were some things you missed out on? Um, an important thing to know about research is you can have a detailed plan about how you think things are going to go. And depending on how the first part of your research goes, that you might continue on that plan or that plan might be blown to pieces. <laughs> And that's okay, that's how research happens. It changes and evolves. So there were some things that I thought I was gonna be doing that I did not do, but because that's not the path that my research mm-hmm. took me and some things I did that I didn't think I was going to do. Uh, so you want to have, but it's still important to have these goals in a plan because if you arrive without a plan, then you just won't do anything mm-hmm. or you'll try and not very, get very much done. So it, it is important to arrive with a plan, but you shouldn't be wed to your plan. Yeah, especially like we mentioned, there's a, there are a lot of holidays mm-hmm. when we when you, we started. So we didn't have like our first five day work week in like a month in or something. Quite a while. Okay. Yeah. So and then you have to add, I guess, like the orientation time and then sample preparation. They, mm-hmm. they have to teach you how to work with the machines. Uh, you also have to. Uh, put yourself in a wait list for some equipment that a lot of people use. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those things may delay what you thought you would be doing and then maybe you'll encounter something that will delay you even more. So, But you definitely do want to have that plan. And like I said, a lot of it goes with or ties into how much time you put in before you even went there. Mm -hmm. So um, when you go on this trip, you are required to register in the spring for a three credit uh, independent study or uh, directed research uh, credit. And this is a it's a course and you get credit for it, but it, it's to make sure that you um, know what you're doing. So during this semester, you will um, pick a topic if you don't have one, do a lot of reading about your topic so you know like what, what papers are out there and what is generally known, come up with um, experiment plans, get to have um, 
video chats with the with the Germans so that you aren't meeting them for the first time when you get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's actually a new requirement. Um, didn't used to require that, but we've found that requiring that pre-semester makes the summer a lot more productive because then you can hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also did the STEM outreach mm. event. Um, this is not just to promote STEM, but also the fact that you can do this sort of thing abroad. So this, this spring we did the, the STEM event so that the students would come in and, and mention some um, turbine parts in different languages. This was with the the younger kids? Yes. So this was with, we had a mixture of middle and high school mm -hmm. uh, students. So um, we participated in UCF STEM Day. So this was our event for STEM Day. And we had, um, I think, a couple middle schoolers and a high school group. And we taught them about um, the parts of a gas turbine engine and also some, some of those words in German. A mix of technical words like inlet and non-technical words like air and heat and then ask them to teach us uh, some of those words in a language that they're learning in school or spoke at home. And that was fun. We also had another activity where we taught them how to build a homemade spectroscope so that you can um, look at light sources through it and it will split it into its component wavelengths of color. And that's pretty neat because it, you can do it with really cheap materials and they mm -hmm. can immediately see the effect. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. Um, doing some sort of outreach is a requirement of the IRES program, but it is completely up to the students to decide what form that will take. We also had weekly meetings to sort out, you know, housing, the budget that we had. Um, I don't know. What, what Very, various logistical things. Yeah, it, I mean, it, you do need that weekly meeting mm -hmm. with, with your group. And we also kind of got to know each other a little bit better before we even went for two weeks and lived in a in a one-room apartment <laughs> together. <laughs> so that helped. Uh -huh. So is this a, an experience that you would recommend? Oh, absolutely. I would say my summer in Germany is one of the most formative experiences that I've had, certainly in my education. And I would absolutely recommend it as long as you're willing to put in the work. If mm -hmm. you're thinking, ooh, I can get NSF to pay for me to have a great German vacation, then don't apply mm -hmm. because... This is for people who want to get good research done and also have an awesome German vacation. Uh -huh. Yeah, you definitely get to know a lot about yourself and you you also appreciate a lot of the things that you do have here in the United States as, as far as water. Um, <laughs> Free water. OK, <laughs> um, I guess not not being spoiled, but the fact that you have the Walmart 24 hours uh -huh. or you can just grab your car and go anywhere at any time. Where, yeah, public transportation there is great, but you also have to think about, okay, at what time do I have to start heading out mm -hmm. so I don't miss my train or my bus or just just little things like that that you don't really appreciate that you, you do have here. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I'd absolutely recommend the trip just or any, you know, summer experience like this, you know, go to Germany or just go to a U.S. lab like you're working with some of the best, you know, scientists and engineers out there mm -hmm. and you're going to learn a lot. So like even the non like just data you take, but just learning, you know, kind of subtleties of like how to operate a certain device or just things you can c come back and apply to your own research. Uh, I definitely learned a lot about, you know, that I can apply to my own research. So. Yeah, and I think uh, you you finally get to see that you, you can do things like this, right? You um, it, it might seem almost impossible to have a paper in your undergrad as you're an undergrad or even meet these people that are so non-known in the industry or they, they're just basically the, the, the go-to people for, for these subjects, right? You see them in papers, books. Uh, conferences. So it's like meeting a famous person, and so mm -hmm. yeah, you you do get the opportunity to do something that you wouldn't you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So it's it's very impressive also that you you took that chance and you were selected among among all these people and you got to go. And we're making a big effort to get the word out a lot more this year. So you know this podcast flyers. We're going around talking to clubs. So you can find the application at aerostructures.cecs.ucf.edu slash IRES slash apply. 
And if you take off the slash apply, that's the, uh, wait, we might have edited the. You'll find it about the IRS. I mean, <laughs> I'll post it on our you Facebook. Have the, the you blog. Can go in there. Mine was actually a little different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I decided to take the aero structures class with Dr. Raghavan. And I was just coming back from a conference. I think it was October 29th or the 30th or something. And I got the message through her class saying, oh, yeah, we have this opportunity. It's due the 31st. <laughs> so I did not go trick-or-treating in the 31st. I was, wow. I was sitting there uh, applying. <laughs> Uh, and once I, I hit the send button, button, I, it's I read that it was only for mechanicals in aerospace. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. And then within I think a month or no, not even a month, a, a couple of weeks, I got a message from her that I was going for um, an interview. Mm-hmm. So, so is it only for mechanical and aerospace, or can any engineering student apply? Um, so. Any engineering student, I think, can apply. Estefania is civil. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was mechanical for my undergrad, when I was in IRES, I was in my master's in materials science. Mm -hmm. So I'm not in MAE. She's not in MAE. But Owen and Deborah Liz are. Mm -hmm. So I would say as long as your research is related to materials for extreme environments, that's close enough. Yeah. What is the application process like? Um, there's a form on the website that asks a couple of um, short answer questions, and um, you also upload a resume and a letter of recommendation. Mm-hmm. And then that sends an email to Dr. Raghavan. She goes over them, and then during the month of November, she holds interviews. And then in early December, she announces who was selected so that they can then enroll in their uh, spring semester preparation class. What kind of things does she ask you during the interview? Um, I know one thing she asked me was if uh, one of the other IRES students said, hey, I'm going to go off to Switzerland, but I'm going to say I'm sick. Will you cover for me? Uh-huh. What would you do? The answer is not cover for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not even necessarily about the research at that point. It's no, trying the, to find like, yeah, the right the interview, characteristics. Of, yeah, it's not a technical interview uh-huh. about what your research is because you don't have to have your research project already. Mm-hmm. Um Deborah Liz and Estefania did not. Um, It's more about your personality, your level of responsibility and maturity Mm -hmm. for her to get a sense of who you are. Are you responsible? Are you going to make the most of this? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a lot more about the culture shock sort of, you know, for me, she I think she asked me the same question. But also, since I was in Stuttgart by myself, it was, are you, you know, how are you going to, you know, handle that? What if this problem arises? So... You know, it, it, so if, you, if you're trying to go to another city as well, you know, you're going to get questions like that. So the interview process, you know, it is per person also. Um, you know, I think I probably got less about the actual research itself since I was a PhD student at the time versus maybe some of them about, you know, what they are expecting for the research. Because I, I you know, I've done research in the past, so she knew kind of I, what my expectations for research were, so... But yeah, it was a lot about, you know, am I going to go like, you know, what do I want to do on my free time? So there was questions about, you know, they asked me about vacationing and stuff. And I said, like, I'd like to go, you know, see some of the other cities in Germany like on the weekends, stuff like that. So and there's absolutely opportunities for that. Like we said before, you know, we went to a lot of cities. So is anyone going to apply again or you're not allowed to, to go again? Uh, I don't believe you're allowed to go again. Okay. I know that. Um, Brooke, who went the year before us, she's a friend of ours, um, wanted to apply the year that we went, but she cannot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But we, Lynn and I, are did apply for the Fulbright Scholarship, mm-hmm. uh, and this would be for, I think, 10 months? It'd be 10 months in Germany. In Germany. When did you find out about that? Um, I think next spring. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll have you back, and we'll do... Um, We'll do a podcast while while you're in Germany. You can call over. <laughs> what is the time difference there between Germany and Seven Germany? hours, six hours? Six hours? six hours over the summer. I'm not sure with daylight savings time if that's going to affect it or not. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it was six hours exactly, uh, and, at least for the summer. And that is something you need to think about when you're trying to communicate with the people back home. Mm-hmm. So if I'm if I send an email after 10 a.m. my time, it's after yeah. Uh, or if they send, if they send, 
which one's backwards. If they send an, an, <laughs> e- the if they send an email to me at noon, uh-huh. it's 6 p.m. for me, so I'm not going to read it. Okay. Um, so if we're going to be communicating, you have to think about the time difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was good because we were always ahead uh-huh. of uh, UCF. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's already tomorrow where you are. Yeah. But yeah, also just, you know, now, you know, I'm sure you guys, do you guys collaborate with, I know Dr. Barsh, um, you know, even like trying to collaborate with them since I've been back, you know, it's been a little difficult because like I'll send an email when I get here in the morning, you know, and I may get a response today. I may get a response tomorrow just because again, they, they're not going to go home and check the email. Right. So, or if they do, they're not going to respond. So I know some of them said they will check email at night, but they don't respond to them. And that's just the way they are, you know, in their culture. Mm-hmm. So if you could pick one thing from your experience that was your absolute favorite takeaway, what would that be? Um, I think it was just, you know, being able to work, uh, you know, at least my facility was, you know, pretty state of the art. You know, they had... You know, so I work on a shock tube here. They had four of them there. And I just worked on one of the shock tubes. So just the ability just to do that and just run, you know, my own experiment basically, you know, all day, every day. You know, I had one person helping me run experiments. But like they have the, you know, so like I wasn't, you know, like taking time away from anybody else. So like just that and the ability just to kind of, you know, do some pretty state of the art experiments was quite nice. So... That was my takeaway. I couldn't possibly pick only one thing. Well, you have to. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, as far as research goes, I think my favorite part was being able to do that, kind of like working, so uh-huh. eight to five, that like, this is my life. I don't have to worry about school. I don't mm-hmm. have to worry about, in in the case for for spring, for example, I was working, going to school, and I was trying to prepare for the for the program. So the fact that I was in Germany and I was just doing that was was really great. And um, again, being able to be with the group, like the uh, thermal barrier coatings group, was quite big within the materials division. And I, I just I really liked the the meetings with them. They were very casual yet effective. Mm-hmm. So I did like that, and as far as like the living situation, just being able to be in a city like Cologne, uh, it's it's more of a city. There, I mean, you can take the train a couple blocks away, and you're in an area full of restaurants and or a park or stuff like that. So, all right, you have to narrow it down. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, since Owen and Estefania talked about research things, uh-huh. I will um, go in a different direction. I had never been to Europe before, so I would say getting to be in a city that old and feel that much history was, uh, I would say, my favorite thing. I have um, an art history minor from my previous degree, uh, and uh, I'm kind of an art nerd, and it was really, really great. Yeah, I was able to geek out with with Lynn because I was working on a minor Mm -hmm. in art history as well. So poor Lynn, I mean, poor Deb Berlis had Mm -hmm. to kind of deal with us. (laughs) (laughs) She was tired of going to museums. Oh. (laughs) Well, how do you say thank you in German? Danke. Danke. Danke danke is thanks Uh or thank you very much would be Danke schön. Danke schön? Yeah. Well, I want to Danke schön you for coming on the show today. That's probably not. Bitte. That's not said correctly, but. (laughs) The IRS program is amazing and you should apply. Cool. All right. I will not be applying, but (laughs) you you should apply. You, the audience. You, the audience. You, the audience, yes. Yes, I will not be applying, but you should definitely apply if you are interested in research and education and materials for extreme environments. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us again this week. I want to thank everyone for listening. And remember, there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. And tomorrow is just a dream away. <laughs>